when the movie opened, it was a big gala for the British Film Institute of which the patron is the Prince Charles. And then he came and it was a huge opening. And then you see, they, they introduce you and you say, hello, how are you? And then he says, were you able to be accurate with the period or something like that? And I said, your highness, <laughs> it is science fiction. It looks period, but it is. Welcome to another episode of the Filmosophers Movie Talk Show. I'm Chris Bush. And I'm Dean Slider. On our podcast, we talk about films and philosophy with people who make and who love the movies. And we're very delighted to have as our guest today, dramatist, painter, film set designer, theater and opera director, and Academy Award winning art director for 1995's Restoration, Eugenio Zanetti. Eugenio, we're so grateful to have you on the show. I'm very happy to be. Thank you. Maybe you could just tell us again a little bit about how you're dealing with the current pandemic and plans for current and future projects of your own. Yeah, well, two, two current things. One is I finish a script that I've been working for four years. Scripts are not so fast. Um, of a movie I want to direct next year called Instructions for the Recently Deceased. And it's a comedy about <laughs> the hereafter um, that I work a lot. And I think I put a lot of, of my views of the world in this non-realistic context. Um, and then I've, I'm doing a book, what is called an interactive immersive book, which is that the paintings, I decided to do a book on the 1001 nights of the pandemic. So I paint once a day already 420 of the 1001 paintings and they are animated. So these have been created to be projected or to be seen on a screen, not, but it's a book. So I'm a lot working with the book and sending people all the tests of the, there will be a moment when we can be a little more free, where this can be shown as a immersive show, where you go into a place where walls, floor, and everything is, has projections and you are <clears throat> surrounded and immersed by the images and the music. So that, the book I'm doing too. And uh, what else I'm doing? Well, I'm painting, I have a studio and I paint every day now also. All night, I spend the nights painting. How early in life did you know that you were going to take this path, this artistic path? Well, as a painter from the very beginning, childhood, um, filmmaker was a different thing. I started in theater in, in Cordoba in Argentina, the province where I came from. Uh, on small theaters in the 60s. And, um, and then I went to Europe in 68. And by a long series of coincidences, I end up working on the crew of Pasolini's Medea with Maria Callas. Mm. So in Turkey, first shooting for a month in Turkey. So I got submerged on film at, in my early 20s, you know, 20, 20 something. And then it becomes a parallel, continuous thing, the paintings and um, production design or art direction in, in, in film and theater. And in the last 20 years, it includes also opera. The wonderful thing with opera is that different from film, nobody has an opinion but the person who is directing the opera. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, if they give you an opera to do, you, that's your universe. So I design the sets and the costumes and do the mise-en-scene and work with the singers and with the, con the conductor, with everybody. So it's like a painting in a way. It's a complete world, very satisfying for me. 
And uh, so opera has been strong these last years. Uh, last year I did two big, big productions, Magic Flute, Mozart's Magic Flute, a complete new production, and um, Tales of Hoffman, which is a mon monumental opera with 250 people on stage. Mm. Wow. So a bit of everything. <laughs> How yes. did you did you get into Hollywood film? Was it, I think Michael Hoffman was an early collaborator and was it your yeah. introduction to him that got you introduced to that world? No, uh, no. I got to design a huge exhibition. I think the Deb was also part of early of that on the DeMille dynasty, the DeMille family, say Caesar B. DeMille and all of them. As when I arrived, I've done films. When I came to America, I was already 40, you know, 39. So I had 20 years of craft. I wasn't an improvised person. I knew my craft pretty well. And people are not stupid. They know when you know what you're talking about. So I got a job almost in pre immediately on a movie called Slam Dance, which wasn't about dancing a thriller directed by Wayne Wang, a great, great director. And uh, from then on, it went with Mike Hoffman, with whom I collaborated in five movies. Uh, we did Promised Land and Some Girls and Soap Dish and many, many, many. We work a lot. And then Joel Schumacher, who recently passed away, we did Flatliners together, and then we went to um, prep for two years Phantom of the Opera, the original movie that actually never happened, but mm. we did the job, we did the work. We, we, we'll, we work a lot, it was very extensive. I still have the drawings. And then I continue. I did Last Action Hero with John McTiernan, with whom I have a film now. We will be shooting in Serbia if it wasn't of the pandemic, because we were there ready to start a film called Tau City with, with um, John McTiernan. And uh, now we are waiting for all the protocols of the universe and things like that. <laughs> And I'd like to get you to talk, please, about um, restoration and what dreams may come, because okay. the, the the two of those films are so both so rich and I think so so bold, so audacious in the design mm -hmm. ideas and in the realization of the yeah. design ideas and and. It's just, it just seems like a miracle that those films happened, that all that got on the screen. Yeah, well, it is sort of a miracle. <clears throat> Restoration, as you probably know, is a movie of a small budget. I mean, in terms of film, I think the, for a period movie with all that thing and cast, I think it was 15 million or something like that at the time. So, Different from movies made in England where you go to some stately home and you dress it and then you shoot it, there was nothing of the period that we needed. So I, I proposed madly to build all the sets and they went for it and we, we did build everything. Mm. <clears throat> so, and that allows us to two things. First is an invented universe. When the movie opened, it was a big gala for the British Film Institute of which the patron is the Prince Charles. And then he came and it was a huge opening. And then you see, they, they introduce you and you say, hello, how are you? And then he says, were you able to be accurate with the period or something like that? And I said, your highness, <laughs> it is science fiction. It looks period, but it is. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's not. And when the movie ended, they were sitting in the row in front of us, prince and princesses and whatever. He turned and says, we wish we have had that kind of court in England. <laughs> 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 he knew that the, it, it never exists. Well, it's a mixture of, you never get the whole package on, in life. You get a tiny thing 
and then you build around. It's not that people says, listen, you'll have a marriage in this movie with barges, gold barges in water in an interior. That doesn't exist. That came with a lot of concealment and lies from the artist, <laughs> which doesn't say really what it's gonna do and surprise everybody. So we built this big set of the palace, which were actually just columns and wheels and casters that we move and reconfigurate as a comb. You know, all the, the rooms were made with the same thing. And we built it on a tank stage. So in one weekend that everybody was having a good time, I had the people to put the columns out, fill the water, put the barges. It was just lit for the palace, so exactly with the same light, they came next day, and voila, the wedding, the director knew, but everybody else didn't. So we shoot that scene that I think is quite, see, we, one of the concerns in the movie was that we couldn't build London. So I choose the river, not the streets of London, ah. as a, which, which actually is quite true for the period. So we built in front of the, the, the studio on a reservoir, London, water. And everything that is related to the river and to was metaphorically correct for the character. Mm -hmm. And all the ideas we got from the Greeks of the river, we never bathed in the same river. Mm -hmm. All the ideas of time, passing of time, et cetera, et cetera, that, that water contains were expressed through the water in, in the film. Uh, we were lucky, yes, in many ways. Uh, even, even on the Oscars things, because you, you never really get the real good jobs uh, don't get reward a lot. Mm -hmm. I, for instance, What Dreams May Come, which is a movie where I spent two and a half years first con conceptually conceiving, developing, shooting, and then post-production, which was very important. Uh, the, the, the Academy at the time has a, had a foggiest idea about what a production designer does and what effects people did. Right. They didn't right. understand that the effects are also designed by the production designer. Right. I mean, the fact that the set is virtual doesn't mean it's not conceived by the same mind that conceived the other sets, right? So I did an enormous job designing the effects, but of course the, the Oscar went to the technicians, right. which were very good. Right. So even then, when they got the Oscar, they have to, they, they say, well, you're not really apologize to Zanetti <laughs> because it's his job. But what I want to say is a miracle for restoration that a small movie got rewarded. Right. And, and the other miracle is how you fooled me with those lies because I was watching that thinking, this thing must have had a huge budget. <laughs> you know, those barges, for anyone who has not seen this film must quick stream it tonight because it, yeah. it's incredible. And it, it, we should mention it's set in the, in the, the, um, the, the, during the reign of, of Charles II, the Merry Monarch, which was the time of just after the Puritan era, just the return of all out sensuality. And, right. Well, you know, the arrival of really the arrival for uh, to England of Renaissance in a way. Yes. So is the end of of many centuries of darkness, in theory. You know that's, mm -hmm. and he represents this new world. And um, I did something in in the movie that I think is interesting. You see, we don't know what the rapport between a common man and the king was at the time because it didn't kings don't mean anything to us today mm -hmm. but on the pyramid of the universe the king was on the top and the common man was on the bottom mm -hmm. and in order for us to understand some of these ideas in order to understand the story i propose that the first time that maribel the character of robert downey jr 
sees the king is in the cabinet of curiosities and uh, there is this planet, a model of the solar system. Yes. And the king is in the middle and the planets move around him. Right. Which is the idea. Yes. <laughs> In yeah. a way to put in the unconscious of the audience that the king is really in the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a lot of those things in the film. And, and uh, no matter what Prince Charles said to you, th there are some details like the pineapples, yes. which was, I just read this the other night, that the yeah. first pineapples grown in England were yeah. during the reign of, of Charles II. Yeah, it was considered a one of the most marvelous things ever. And on what dreams may come, if I may please comment too, um, there was one thing, it was a, a great script, but it didn't have any explanation of what visually was expected of that. At the beginning of the script, you could read, at the bottom of a volcano, Mm. And nothing else was said in the whole script. So everything you see in what is may come, we invented, we came up with. And there was always the danger of kitsch because a city in heaven or in hell, it's, first it's patronizing to tell people this is what hell or heaven looks like because <laughs> mm -hmm. everybody has the right to imagine a different one. So I propose something that I think that it worked, and I think it was a contribution that conceptually was important. And is that each character has his own or her own hell or heaven. So uh, the character of Robin Williams chooses a, a hell, a heaven, which is the paintings of his wife. He inhabits the paintings. Therefore, all those sequences were in a world made of oil painting. So, so that idea of, of the, the, have the environment coming out of her paintings and her being a painter, did that come from you? Yeah. Oh, because that's the whole film. As well, far as I'm concerned. Well, that, for instance, yeah, uh, the idea that uh, the daughter has this marionette theater and when you go to her heaven is like the marionette theater, only on a universal scale. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that the son is playing the first morning when they are alive in the kitchen with the uh, airplane carrier. And then on a trip to hell, there is, a, there is a real airplane carrier, gigantic destroyer that goes the, the ship to hell. And uh, so it all, has to do with what the way they see this universe is through the, um, I'm sorry, we audience understand where it comes from this imaginary mm -hmm. because we have seen these people before. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're at all familiar with the, uh, the kind of scheme of things in the Tibetan Book of the Dead Yes. where, you know, supposedly we go through the, the bardos, the in between, the intermediate stages between death and rebirth. And mm -hmm. we pass through all these different kind of worlds and, and dimensions. But again and again, you're cautioned, don't reach out, don't get caught up in them. They're all just the creation of your own consciousness. Yeah. Well, you know, I was commenting before that I the script I'm working, which is called Instructions for the Recently Deceased, is um, a comedy, not, not a funny comedy, but a comedy mm -hmm. about people, what happens the first two weeks after death, basically, and how they are prepared to continue the road. So it's exactly what, and um, there is a lot of, of what you just said, you know, there is a moment that finally the person who has guided these characters through these two weeks of instructions tells the protagonist, well, you know, I'm a figment of your imagination. Right. <laughs> right. Everything you see is 
a figment of your imagination. I'm myself a figment of your imagination. Right. We don't have to wait till after death to enjoy that realization. <laughs> we can enjoy it here and now. Yes, yes. Yeah. You mean we are all figments of our imagination? We project from our own consciousness the reality. Well, you know, I, I direct a movie that I also wrote called Amapola. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody who's dead, the grandmother, says to the protagonist, who is a woman, um, well, you know, this is all a dream, but you need to dream a better dream, darling. <laughs> because everything is, is not good in the life of this person. Right? So we need to dream a good dream. You know, and it's up to us to dream a good dream. Yeah. Yeah. There, there also, I, f I felt that in um, uh, What Dreams May Come, there's a lot of echoes of, of Dante. Well, yes, and it's, it's, it's a parallel that you cannot escape because it's an archetype. Um, the Divina Commedia is an archetype for all our culture. I mean, we, it's all there. Mm -hmm. um, when they wanted, I tell you a short story, they wanted uh, Morricone to do the music, Ennio Morricone. And um, they said, well, you speak Italian. He has a script, just talk to him. Don't mm -hmm. ask me why. So I call them and oh, see, sí, fantastic, La Divina Comedia. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Ennio, you know, it's not really La Divina Comedia, but you know, I mean, you, yes, they are parallel. I says, okay, I'll send you things. I will compose things because uh, the, the producer thought, okay, he did the, the, the mission, so he should do these heavenly choirs. I don't know why they ask him. I mean, of course, he's a great composer. He was a great composer. Anyway, here is a story, very short. He was paid a million dollars for film to do the music. And there were only 600,000 for the music. So Robin Williams, who was making 25 million as a lead in the movie, put the money needed to complete the million. So I talked to Morricone and a month later, a cassette, this is not a, a white cassette that I still have can. I put the cassette and he's, here is Ennio saying, team number one, bling, 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 piano. Team with a whistle. <laughs> okay, so I go and knock at the door of Robin. I said, do you have a cassette player? He says, he says, here, this is a $1 million cassette. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, the, the Divina Commedia is an archetype for the, for... So did any of the Morricone music make it into the film? I have it here. No, oh. because, you know, they did uh, an, a mistake that is done a lot. They use his music from other movies, the highlights of Morricone, and nobody can come and bring the same power to a new... Right. You know, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. If you take uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, Once Upon a Time in America, and make uh, a demo with it, uh, the real music will never reach that. So they pay him the million dollar. They didn't use the music. I have the cassette. <laughs> and they call Michael, Michael. <laughs> they call another composer very good. And in two weeks, he made another music. So stories of how it happens to show. <laughs> right. Because of Hollywood folly, <laughs> you were, you know, the, I think the peak of your prowess in art and set design and production design in Hollywood. But um, I think The Haunting was that your last big Hollywood film. Yeah. Can you speak to? I did also big movies, Hollywood movies, quote unquote, like uh, like Derby Dragons, which uh, is a huge movie also on the Spanish Civil War that we, mm. we shot in Argentina and Spain. Sorry. But was it a, a matter of just personal choice, artistic choice to move in another direction? Because no doubt you could have continued on that path in high demand in yes. the world. Well, I found that the people I work with originally uh, become very old and um, the new directors have a little fear that the 
lack of knowledge will be too obvious if they have collaborators who have a lot of experience. So they prefer somebody who has less experience like them. Uh, and that's a, that's a situation, yeah. I, I was offered things, um, I don't know, I took, I have 25 years of very good work in America, but because I arrived at 40, I was like 60 something. I don't even know the existence of the third act. And I think the worst, the Sunset Boulevard syndrome of somebody who wants to extend forever career is not a good thing for creative work. You have to keep doing the creative work, but you don't, but not, it cannot be, your second act cannot be extended forever. It's a moment that you say this is finished and now, and the truth is that I've been much freer and happier in the third act and much more creative than I was. For instance, I went back to painting, which I abandoned in America because it's very difficult to have a career in America. For instance, it's rare that you do film and opera. You know, usually you do film or you do opera. And now I do everything. I do film, I do opera, I paint. So I think it's more, I don't know. And I have a house that I wanted to have in America and I couldn't in, <laughs> that I built outside in the country. So no, it's fine. Uh, Hollywood is not the center of the universe at all. If, if we can get back for, for a moment to yes. what dreams may come, because yeah. I'm so fascinated by the effect when, when the Robin Williams character goes into his wife's oil paintings and he's slipping around in the oils and, and then they, they tr later they transform into something more quote unquote real. Could, could you talk about how that was done? It was just astounding. Yeah. Well, it was, it was developed a um, technology that didn't exist using something called LIDAR, which makes a map, three dimensional map of, of a room, of a landscape to which you can apply digital things, color textures and things. Now, the idea was to do the famous, uh, uh, now I don't know how you say it in English. The idea was to do a three dimensional thing, but it was very funny because we all forgot that film is two dimensional. So three dimensional doesn't really. So mm -hmm. they did an enormous amount of tests and spent millions trying to get this thing in which you will move around an object and get, yeah, you can do that with 2D, perfectly believable, which is actually what happened after spending fortunes trying to make it a 3D. Um, so once we got to that, it was just a question of applying these textures to everything. The sets you see were actually built and now this is a funny story. Up and then apply the digital thing and they are made of oil paintings. But there was a moment that the money was over and we haven't finished all the sequences made of paint. And they say, well, you know, this old scene in the house in heaven inside in, Queen, in which Robin Williams and Cuba Gooding are talking, we don't have money to make that. Oil, you make it yourself. So. I have brush strokes painted on gauze, brush strokes of color, then cut off the gauze and hang it with sewing black thread in the set. So, and lit all this little. So you look at these all brush strokes in the air, but they are actually things hanging there. Now, Werner Herzog came to visit and he says, oh, I want to see, because somebody told me I will never see a set like these. <laughs> and it's a simpler thing, you know, it's a trick, a theatrical trick. So we entered the room, it was lit because we were shooting. And he will see these things passing by in 3D, right? Transparent. And he's like, 
You know, he's very peculiar. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> oh, yes, I know. I will never see this again. Just go and do it again from the other side. <laughs> and then I explain what it is. Look, look, if you put, you know, and mm -hmm. so nothing is a good. I had there the two heroes of my teens, which is Max von Sydow uh -huh. from The Seventh Seal. Yes. The movie that moves me a lot in, in my teens. Yes. And on the other seat was Werner Herzog and the Enigma of Kasper Hauser was another movie that changed my life. So it was fabulous. And wow. So we, we went home and cooked pasta and have a great time. Oh, that's just <laughs> right. Film lovers heaven. And you got Werner to do a, a voice in one of the right, wasn't he a voice in the Sea of Faces? Oh, yeah. He came, that, that's why he said, I have to be in the movie. I said, well, you could be <laughs> in the Sea of Faces. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then we put a beer on him so he wasn't so obviously recognizable. Uh -huh. And then uh, Robin... Well, I, I'll tell you, he was immediate. The, the moment I heard him say one word, he was completely right. recognizable. Was, that, right. No one else about, has that voice. Talk about he a loved third it. Act. He loved it. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is that all this is it's, it's ad lib, what Robin says. Because he says, uh, son, is that you, son, or something like that. Yes, Papa. Oh, Herbert or something. <laughs> you. And he realizes it's not his father. But that was, just a, sorry, sorry, you know. All that was sort of ad lib and improvised, yeah. How, how, did, how did you create the sea of faces? For, for people who haven't seen it, it's this, this is something that will haunt your dreams and not in a good way. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's this hell, hell vision of kind of gray faces all looking up from a, from a flat plane and, and, yeah. and the characters That's have very, to... Very, very thing. Well, it was one person and two rubber masks. So, because uh, it's impossible to get people so close uh, to humans. So uh, you have humans and masks that move. And then it was a, yeah, a flat thing and people were underneath. Literally, what you see is what it was. Um, and it came from an image that haunted my childhood because it's an illustration of Gustave Doré for the Divine Comedy, ah. in which everybody's still here in ice. Right. So I just had the chance to bring something that haunted me uh, literally to the film. Yeah. But there were things that were lost and were very difficult to do. For instance, we built this cathedral, cathedral upside down, and we actually built it on a huge hangar in which is that the house they were living has been thrown to hell and has landed in a huge cathedral upside down of which we see a scene of them walking but you don't see a one fifth of of the set that was enormous no? mm. so well nothing happened the other thing i'm proud and i is uh, thank to jorge luis borges our great mm. author is the uh, library in what in the water? The, the oh, it's the library of Babel. Right, it's, the, it's, it's a version of Borges, the library of Babel. Yeah. Um, so that that again, we use one tenth of what you could you could shoot a whole movie there. It was because we built half of it really and put the water and everything and the people and then the rest was added was added digitally but it was enormous said i mean and now now that the way it's developed digital maybe it's easier to do those things that when we did it and it's one thing to conceptualize a painting and execute it with oils or whatever on the on the easel but to see these visions made manifest in <laughs> semi-reality. It must be very fulfilling. Was it extremely gratifying for you to see these, these ideas come to life? Must be. Yeah. Yes, it was. Uh, at the same time, a film, a complex film, brings a lot of madness with it. So um, it's not 
sewing and singing, as they say in Spanish. <laughs> it's, it's <clears throat> you put your life and you leave pieces of you in this, to get these images to happen, yeah? which is fine. But then when the movie over, is over, <laughs> you find that some pieces are gone, you know? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> um, no, but I mean, I'm in general happy. And, and movies that are not so good, but from the point of view of the production design were good, like The Haunting, which is, a, you know, I don't, I don't like the film really for many reasons, but we did some things there that were very interesting. Um, again, all these things start to be commented in another moment because they contain things that are irrelevant for the design, but important for how you get things to happen, you know, how you manipulate in a certain way the, the world for the things to be seen. For our audience who would like maybe to understand better the role of the art director, the production designer, the set designer, and the role they play behind the scenes and how that role integrates with the screenwriting and the direction and the, everything. Can you share a little bit, uh, give a little insight? The problem is that in many ways, people don't really know what production designer means. They think it's some sort of production job. Uh, but it was created for William Cameron Maces, the title in the 40s, because it was one of the greatest designer ever and means a production design by. It means that everything has been designed by somebody in the production. And that person is the production designer uh, or the art director. The thing is that in, in movies, there are sometimes very big movies and then the production designers has a couple of art directors to help. So it's a question of nothing, of names. Um, I think that it depends on how you have been formed as an artist, the idea that you can go, for instance, in Flatliners, I went, you know, I, I had no authority. I was a production designer, again, first studio movie I was doing. And I said to Michael Douglas, who was a producer, look, after the first and the second characters die and come back, it's all repetitious, let's use Orpheus, Orpheus, and let's have Julia Roberts' character going. She doesn't come back. And then the guy who's in love with her goes to the other side and bring her back, which is the most famous myth about death that exists, Orpheus and Eurydice. I said, oh, you are European with all those things about <laughs> myth. I say, well, listen, myth, myth is not a European invention. Myth in, is in everybody's mind. It be, belongs to the collective unconscious. The lady who's cleaning the office knows as much as you and me about Orpheus. They, they couldn't. Yeah, I tried, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think the movie will have been much better mm -hmm. because it will have brought to the third act emotion and romance, which was lacking of. But anyway, that's, so this is because you asked me, how do I sometimes try to put my, you know, five cents on, on other things like the script or the music? Yeah. Now, for, for example, in, in Restoration, the yeah. just insanely lavish costumes. I mean, there is a costume designer, but they certainly s must be of a piece with, with, with all these all insanely lavish sets. So are you just working, are, are, are you conceiving of the, the basic idea of the costumes or is there just back, are you sitting at a table with the costume designer yeah. working yeah, together? Yeah, well, of course, it's a collaboration. Um, yeah, because there will be a moment in which those things are together and they have to somehow belong to the same universe, the costumes and the sets and the whole thing. It's difficult to say, it sounds very pedantic. So I don't know how to solve the problem. I, I decide to sound pedantic and say it anyway, which is that you, my idea is that the, 
all that universe have to be invented by the production designer working with the director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's it, everything. How the light goes through the window. Everything is, you know, photography, everything is part of the same thing. It doesn't mean that the production designer does everything, but it should be part of the conceptual development of everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, this is, this is good. I wanted to ask you this because it's a moment that's completely puzzling to me, which is in um, What Dreams May Come, when Robin Williams goes to visit his wife in the sanitarium, when she's had the breakdown, and she's sitting on a green lawn wearing a dress that's exactly the same color green. And it, it, it doesn't make sense to me. And there is a branch. There is a branch that moves a bit also green. A branch of a, uh -huh. of a how you call it? It's a tree that, that's a crying something. Wi uh, willow, weeping willow. Weeping willow. Mm -hmm. Yes. That also, the same green also. Yeah, it's all, of course, we, we, we compose it. Right. But, but why is she... Why is she the same green as the lawn? Why is she kind of melting into the lawn? I would have thought of her as at that moment, she's like her, her emotions are just black and dark. Well, black, she is in hell. Right. After, after that scene, she commits suicide. And then we see her in jail with the same, the same outfit that is in blue when she's alive is in black in jail. This is before going to jail. I don't know, we didn't want, you, you didn't want to tell that she's actually going to kill herself. Mm -hmm. We want to think in that scene that she's trying to get well. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's difficult to, I remember the choice of all, everything green. Yes, and we should Yeah, yeah. So maybe the green there was more the aspiration or something. No, I don't think that colors work in a symbolic way. Mm. They work in a context, in a moment, emotionally, but not, not because of the significance. Uh, yeah, I'm trying but, to but be. I'm, I, I'm trying, trying to be too. The the green was sad. That uh -huh. green was very sad to uh -huh. me. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, without being funeral. Right. <laughs> Right. I'm sorry, you were saying something. Yeah, no, no, no. Just to say, I, I, I was trying to think too literally. Because <laughs> that's, that's one of the reasons I'm not an artist. <laughs> no, but many times you do things that people, and, and, and afterwards you tell people, this, that was by accident. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, no, it's not possible. Yes, right. some things happen by accident. Right, right, right. In right. a context, mm -hmm. but now, they do. Now, c color seems to be so, you know, and vivid, rich color seems to be so central to your work. And I know that one of your favorite directors and <laughs> everyone's favorite director <laughs> who knows about film is, is Fellini. And my impression, and I wanted to check this with you, is that all his great films, La Dolce Vita, Eight and a Half, The White Cheek, all that. And his most, his most beautifully realized film dreams are all black and white. And that when he gets to, to color, when he gets to Julieta of the Spirits and Amarcord and Roma, it, for me anyway, it never seems to, to work as well. No, he belongs to a generation where it, it was an imposed thing to them, color, uh -huh. because, you know, it happens, it happens to Berman. You know, Berman said when he was going to do a cries and whispers, cries and whispers. Cries and whispers, he says, well, you know, I knew that I will never get the movie done in black and white because it's a story of this woman dying of cancer and the daughter's there. And I, I thought, I have to distract the people for a second of what the movie is about so I can the discourse, the speech can come out and be accepted. Otherwise, it's going to be unbearable. So it's just, you know, we made it in color and we make the sets red. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and it's incredible because it's a period movie, but everything is bright red. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because otherwise, 
my question, what I always say is, if Burma needs a pretext to say his thing, why not all of us? You know, you, you use pretexts mm. in order to be accepted and swallowed by the audience, mm -hmm. what you want to do. Mm -hmm. If you just go with doing what, you know, there is certain things you accept that needs to be done in order for the audience to eat it. Mm -hmm. Somehow. Sure. Can we talk a little bit more about a few of your favorite films and, and feel yeah. free to, I mean, you had, you had mentioned a few of them to us and I think you know, we had a chance to revisit before this conversation, some of them which are among our favorites as well and Fellini's Eight and a Half among them and Michael Powell's um, The Red Shoes with Moira Shearer, uh, Orson Welles' The Trial, um, uh, Orpheus, Cocteau's Orpheus. Um, share a little bit with us. What, what makes those films meaningful, okay. memorable to you? And I uh, would love, love to hear your thoughts. Well, Red Shoes happens when I was like six years old uh, in a world without television. And I was a child in Cordova. We didn't have television. We didn't even have a radio. Uh, I was in a world where, and suddenly you go to the movies and see this thing and, and your head explodes. And I still, still exploding today because of that movie, you know? And a lot of my work has been and is influenced by Powell. Uh, the Black Narcissus is another one that, that inspires me continuously. Um, Yesterday, for this movie that I'm planning on the first two weeks after death, I want I use the example talking to people in my team of the famous scene in Black Narcissus where the nun is playing a bell and is supposedly in front of an abyss, an enormous. Uh, it was shot very simply, of course, in pine wood without anything. And it was just a glass painting of the profound thing. And it was very simple and absolutely efficient. You see, the funny thing, uh, speaking of restoration for a second, is that when we did restoration, uh, the steel uh, if virtual effects were not... No, I used the two guys that were in the 70s at the time at, at the studio who did glass paintings. And in the only times that we see London is a reservoir where I put the boats. The wall in the left, we are painted a bridge. And then all London is painted on a glass, which we shot on the set, like the old fashioned things. And it works and doesn't need to be more. <laughs> you know what I mean? It works perfectly all right. So, I think we have to reevaluate the use of complex effects and camera moves that digital will allow us because we break certain laws that are very important for the audience. If you move the camera 300 miles per hour, the audience knows that it's not happening, that that's, that's right. digital, that that's right. not. You don't get the feeling of being there while it happens. So my, I always telling people, listen, if you're gonna do this camera move, make it similar to what it would have been if it was a real camera. Right. Don't go faster because then you ruin the whole illusion. It's, it's right. always an illusion. Right. So I'd be very careful with, the, with effects. Um, I, I, think I, I think when in a, in, a, in a world where anything is possible, anything can happen. And, you know, with the, the overuse of CGI, everything does happen. Everything kind of loses its, its value. It all becomes kind of, so what? It's all fueled by drugs. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is, this is an uneasiness with the universe that keeps people wanted to move continuously and to have cuts of half a second and that's because of what they are taking. Uh -huh. It's yeah. nothing to do with art. Right. I think it's, it's catering to the uh, attention deficit generation. 
yeah, it's catering to a phenomenon that is happening for the last 30 years in which certain drugs have taken over and um, people are very excited continuously and that's the way the movies are. Right. It's very difficult. It used to be that what, what you do in the first act of a movie to know a character was what allows the character then in the third act to do what he does because you knew him. If you bring that script today, they will say, oh, get out of all that. Let's just go to the story. Let's, let's not be around this character so much in the first act. Let's just go to the action. And then in the third act, you will not understand why he's doing what he's doing. No. So it's very dangerous what happens with narrative that in many cases, the short attention span, which is a created thing, um, doesn't allow the narrative to flow correctly. You know, you, you, you can kind of see perhaps the, the moment of, the, of that transition uh, at the beginning of um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where in, in the old days, we would start with him as the professor and, 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 and have the quiet exposition. And then he puts on his hat and goes into the jungle. And in that film, first we get right, we're thrown right into the action. He's got the hat, he's got the whip, all that. Then we go back and get the quiet thing. And now they would just start with the action and we would never get the quiet part. I never know who the guy is. Yeah. The problem is without the guy having problems with the students and blah, 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 blah. That's the guy, yes. It's, it's, it, anyway. do, you stay, do you stay current with film? And are there any films of the last few years that you know, you've, you've enjoyed and that have, have inspired you? Or yes, or yes, you? there are. There are some. My problem is the same thing that happens with books. You go back and reread the novels and the things that are the books that are important to you. And I, I'm very careful to what I feed myself and I wait for at least five very good friends to tell me you should see this movie before seeing it. Otherwise I just watch again eight and a half or whatever. <laughs> a movie that nourish me. I mean, I need nourishment. I don't care so much for entertainment. I want substance. And I found it in certain movies, not in every movie. And I, I don't think it's good to see so much. And I don't really particularly think it's good to see so many series. Because even if Fanny and Alexander was a series originally, and, and Berman used 13 hours of footage to make a movie two hours long that is fabulous, I think that series uh, create this problem for regular film, which is that they have so many hours to tell a story and to develop characters that people don't know how to do it in two hours on a film mm. anymore because they have, they have got to the amount of narrative that it is involved in a series. So I don't watch series. Last year, we spent the year in Europe in a fabulous rented house in Spain. And they have on these huge TVs already all these series, right? And I watch uh, the tale of the servant, what is a handmaid's tale. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I was painting and in the same room, it was a TV on and my family was watching it, right? And I hear the horrible sounds of people which whatever tortures are in, in this movie, which is actually very well done. But I was painting and I didn't want to turn because it was so horrendous. Um, so horrendous what happened and I wonder has to be horrendous for people to consider something good and contemporary uh, what is it? Is it mm. it's maybe that I belong to another world I don't know mm. you know I resist violence I resist watching violence I don't give my self to violence and I don't enjoy it. And a lot, the only good thing with the CG new heroes and American heroes flying around is that the good guys win 
<laughs> the only good thing. <laughs> Fortunately, that's still the case. I want to back to eight and a half and the red shoes. Yeah. These are both movies of, um, you know, the life of the artist and artistic conflict and, you know, the, the, the director whose creativity abandons him in, 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 in the case of red shoes, the, you know, the artistic aspiration and the, the choice of devotion to art at all costs. Um, were you, do you think you were drawn to these, these two films particularly because they, they, they reflect your, your artistic life? Yeah, well, with the red shoes, I imagine I didn't know anything of the world. I was six years old. Is he really? um, I, I only watch another thing in my childhood, which was the Beijing National Theater or something that was on tour in Argentina. We saw it. And that was the one that unfortunately, the, that was, the, I think, the last time they were seen because the plane crashed. Oh. This is in the 50s. The, and this was the old actors who, who will play the, the Chinese. Uh, anyway, so those two things really form uh, a substance in my mind, yes. And red shoes is something that I visualize as, as the future and in, in many ways happen. Because between when I'm doing just now, which we did just before the pandemic, we did um, Tales of Hoffman. And how much I was in the world of red shoes without looking at all, but how much that all the conflict and everything was, was <laughs> living the red shoes, right? So uh, it's been a good, opera has been a great thing also for me because you see, every person has a different button to be pushed to produce and to take from inside whatever he or she has. And my button is not visual. It's not that I look at a painting or a movie and it's music. I have a musical button. So mm -hmm. I have to find the music first and then the ideas mm -hmm. happen, right? And that's a very peculiar thing and that's, that's another reason why opera works so well for me because from the beginning is is the music right now i have a friend if i have a, a second i mean less than a minute i have to say something important a friend of mine who is a very well known expert on quantum uh quantum concepts quantum theory told me that apparently there are several parallel universes in use of, you know, and that anything that an artist creates here already exists in another universe. So it comes and it comes through you. And, and yesterday I was reading a letter from Mozart to Salieri mm -hmm. saying, Yesterday, the thing that comes to me came again. <laughs> the mm -hmm. thing that comes to me. That's mm -hmm. how Mozart called that thing that came through him. So if quantum physics are more or less right, we don't create anything. We are just available for the thing to pass through. And that's takes a lot of ego from the artist, right? Because it's not, it's not us, it already exists. I only, mm -hmm. and it happened to me a lot, you know, that I get a script and I don't analyze the script and two weeks later, it just came to me complete finish with all the trims. And I say, where does it come from? And then we make the movie and it looks exactly how I visualize it. But I didn't study the thing like, at all. Mm -hmm. I just read it, I got informed. And somebody told me, well, because we are very refined computers, you input this thing, blah, 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 that's the job and X truths. Fine. Mm -hmm. I like better the story of the things that exist already in a parallel universe. Well, mm -hmm. Some people get to be the conduits for I, these beautiful expressions. Yeah. 
And sometimes, as they say of Mozart, that obscene creature. <laughs> That's what Salieri said to God. Why did you give it to this obscene creature and not to me? <laughs> mm -hmm. but, and, and actually, at least in the, the version of the, the Mozart myth in, yeah. in, in Amadeus, I, yeah. it's because he's a, he's a child. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, being child. Yeah, he's like he's like a child, and he's able to just get out of the way and 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 let it flow through him, you know. And it's the same it's the same in the world of you know spirituality and meditation. You know, when Jesus says you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, be like a little child, have that that fresh yeah. eye, have that innocence. Don't be an expert. What is interesting, I think, is from the point of view of the artists. There's another letter that I read not long ago, which moved me a lot. And is that Bach, Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, comes back home after a tour, a long tour, and he finds that his wife and two of his children had died of the plague. And that night he writes, he writes a piece that translates, is Jésus que ma joie de the more. Uh, God don't kill my joy. Mm. What he what he composes is called que ma joie demeure, that my that my happiness, that my joy doesn't die. And mm. this is the center of the problem of the artist. If you let your joy die, you cannot be an artist. Mm. And and that's what that's Mot, uh, Bach understood clearly that and it's, it's a great piece to listen to too. Mm. Je and, suis you, que de meur. and you know, there's this whole myth of the suffering artist that art has to come out of suffering. <laughs> I think nineteenth century drugs. Yes. <laughs> Liquids, yellow liquids. Right. No, 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 no. Right, right. right. Uh, the opposite. Yeah, the yeah. opposite. But when you take any way, Proust, and excuse me for the pedant, pedantic thing, mm -hmm. but Proust says something that is extraordinary. It says that the whole architecture and construction of the, memor the memories, remembrance, mm -hmm. It's supported by a tiny, tiny drop, which is the perfume and the flavor of our childhood. That remains when people have died and the building have collapsed. Mm -hmm. This tiny thing steals there, the smell, the perfume, and support the whole building of remembrance, mm -hmm. of whatever it is. And I think it's fantastic. You see, there are certain things that are tiny that support the whole structure of our memory. And memory is where we, that's why we like eight and a half, because we have a memory. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we forget it. Mm -hmm. We're very interested to hear a little bit about your, your uh, inspiration and commitment with the... Uh, um, uh, with Sufi uh, practice and yeah. Sufi knowledge and how yeah. that has informed your perspective in life, how that, yeah. how that fuels you and how it perhaps informs your artistic work as well. Share with us and our audience a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, look, um, I'm 64, which means that I was 18 or something. I met this guy who came to Argentina, who was a French guy, who was a representative of a Sufi teacher, an Afghan Sufi teacher. And anyway, I started this, Sufism is a philosophy, as you know, it's not a religion, it's a philosophy. Uh, and it's not necessarily Islamic. A lot of the classical authors were born in the world of Islam, therefore the shape of their work like Rumi or even Al-Arabi is like Islamic, but the actual philosophy 
doesn't belong to any religion. It's not a religion. And for some reasons, you see, the, the thing is that there is only, hmm, how do you say? Nobody is a teacher but, a, but one teacher. There is no, you are a student and there is a teacher, period. And I had a teacher for 50 years, um, Omar Ali Shah. Um, and their work is very similar to the work of, a mixture of the work of an artist and a surgeon, because they deal with extremely technical things and poetry all together. Mm. <laughs> so that, that, mm. that's, that's a, I am not, you see, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm, 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 I'm just a sim simpatico to Sufism. But as I said before, I try to meditate for 50 years. I'm, I'm, my mind doesn't work that way. But when I'm painting, sometimes people come and says, and I say, let's go and have dinner. And he says, well, it's four o'clock in the morning. And I thought it's six, I'm six hours earlier. So I've lost consciousness of time for five hours painting. And it's the closest thing I will ever get to meditate, but it works. Uh, so I don't know, I'm, I'm a bad example because I'm, I'm not an expert at all. Uh, I've seen the work of the teacher. I, I, I have the chance to be a witness to his work and it really belongs to a different realm than what we call spirituality. It's a different thing. It's closer to a surgeon, as I said before, mm. you know, who goes and cuts and takes away. The idea of void that a teacher, is all a question of experience. You cannot talk about these things because they mean absolutely nothing. So the experience is that when you are with somebody who has experienced something similar, as we are in groups of people who have been part of a, what we call it the tradition, Sufism, you knew what the other guy is talking about because you have gone through the experience, but you cannot read it in a book because it means nothing. But I think the teacher gives you a pre-taste of the void of nothingness. And that's powerful, mm -hmm. <laughs> to say the least. It's mm -hmm. powerful because uh, you, 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 and then you say to, I remember saying to the teacher many times, well, because we are a drop of nothing in the universe, one of those. And he says, no, 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 you are, you, you are important. No, you're not nothing in the universe, but has nothing to do with ego mm -hmm. being, you know? Uh, and a lot of humor is the other thing that Sufis has through humor, through storytelling, uh, avoiding miracles, making them secretly, uh, not being able to talk about those things, all those things. The thing is, that they said the difference between a Sufi and a guru is that the guru needs the students and in Sufism, the students need the teacher. Hmm. Um, they don't like the gurus a lot, the Sufis, <laughs> hmm. uh, because they think that they tend to use in their own purposes. But anyway, let's not talk bad of the gurus. Hmm. Um, I don't know what else could be of interest on this thing, except that they tolerate me. As Sean Penn says when he got the Oscar, instead of saying, you love me, you really love me, he says, you tolerate me, you really tolerate me. <laughs> uh, they tolerate me, so I'm glad and thankful. I, I had a Sufi friend years ago who uh, used to bring me in New York City. It was an old converted firehouse and where their um, Turkish Sufi master would come and they would do zikr uh, the the dancing and the the, the you remember the, who was the Sufi master? Um, I don't. They just called him Effendi, you know, which was like a term of of respect. It was fat or thin. Fat. 
Well, he was a great teacher. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and being, I don't know if it's part of the Turkish culture, but part of the thing was he was throwing cigarettes to all of us. I, I still have somewhere as a cigarette that he, that he threw to me. But, and we would chant, we would have our, you'd have your arm over the shoulder of the guy on one side and around the waist of the other side and singing la ila ha ila la, la ila ha ila la for hours. It was very powerful. Well, the, just one thing about that. Um, what I know is that you cannot repeat things. The teachings are only valid while the master is alive. When he dies, the format changes. Hmm. A new teacher comes and you, you shouldn't do what he used to do. Hmm. And Rumi taught in when he lived the dance. The, mm -hmm. the dance. It doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be performed in New York or in LA or in Buenos Aires by another group of people. It has to be, the teacher is like a doctor. He has to prescribe. But if you just love to turn and twirl and turn, it will not work. I mean, you can do it for the rest of eternity. Mm -hmm. It will not make any changes. It's only the teacher who knows what is needed, which format. The mm -hmm. message is always the same. What they talk about is always the same. Right. It's just that the format has to be adapted to a certain community, the right people, the right time. Has to be alive. Yeah. You know, a teacher of mine once said, and actually, Chris, you know this teacher, this was Jerry Jarvis many years ago. And I heard him say, he said, you want to hear the history of religion in a nutshell? One day a guy was sitting in, in a tomato patch and he experienced transcendence. You know, maybe his four hours went by or something. And 2,000 years later, people are all sitting in tomato patches waiting for the experience and wearing little tomato, sacred tomato medallions around their necks. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't dare. You really understand that it's very precise and it's mm. not approximative. Mm -hmm. the work of the teacher and there has to be a teacher alive mm -hmm. there has to and it has to be a teacher mm -hmm. all of which is not so easy mm -hmm. thank you for, always, huh? i know i just appreciate your sharing that personal side of of the spiritual interest and and how it, it just helps us understand who you are a little more yeah well you know Thank you. Um, no, I've been blessed with a lot of things. And as, as I quote Sean Penn, they tolerate me, which is a lot. You know, I, I was interested to ask you, you know, and it's just uh, maybe a, um, a sign of our times, a sign of the culture that, you know, in your obituary, and first of all, wish you long, long, long life, but you know, when the time comes, it's going to lead with Academy Award winner. And your other gr wonderful achievements, your great contributions to art, you know, are you okay with that? I mean, you've certainly thought about that. Are you reconciled to the idea that that will be what, what people remember, or many will remember? I tell you one thing, I work for to almost 20 years, I think, with your sister, Deb. Deborah, yes. and she is an invaluable collaborator and friend that I love. And she okay. always said that my obituary, no, that in my tomb, tombstone will be written, too much is not enough. Uh. <laughs> now, that was during the, that was Deborah, uh, she wrote it, okay, uh, but I think that that was my Hollywood period. I don't think that too much is not enough reflects today for me. But anyway, well, to Deborah, we'll, my love. We'll be sure that Deborah gets to see this interview. And the Academy Award aside, perhaps this conversation we're having with you, shared with our audience, will provide a, 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 a perfume of remembrance. As Mr. Bruce said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Beautiful. Usually when the interviews are, end, I say to myself, oh my God, the most important thing I wanted to say, <laughs> it never happened. But uh, I think that <clears throat> it's not so important what we say, but we get, as you say, a perfume of a swift, a perfume of what the other person is and where it is. And, and uh, in the middle of these difficult times that we are, I have to say, I, I don't ignore the enormous suffering that is happening, but inside myself, there is joy. And I, have, I cannot work against it. So joy is the most, it flows, you know, joy flows. So you just have to let it flow. Well, I think we're really grateful, you, Eugenio, that you shared some of that joy with us and with the audience. It's been such a treat, so delightful, and very grateful that you've joined us on this episode of the Fomasur Show. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the Philosopher's Movie Talk Show. Please subscribe to stay up to date on our newest episodes.